All right, everybody, we're live. Uh, first, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. My name is David Pipe. I'm a local mortgage agent here based in Guelph. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Rob Kent, who is a local realtor with eXp Realty, uh, also based out of Guelph. Um, tonight, we're going through and just sort of helping you to understand in this video um, how you can be successful as a buyer in the market in 2021. So we're going to talk through some of the strategies, some of the challenges that we're all facing, and some of the ways that we can maximize your outcome and maximize the chances that you're going to get you know, the house that you want and get approved the mortgage that you need for that um, this year in 2021. A couple of housekeeping pieces for you. So first of all, we're recording the meeting tonight. Everybody will get a, a copy of the meeting for tomorrow. We usually send it out within about a day. So if you have any questions about the content, you can share it with your family or watch it again later. Um, secondly, um, please, we do encourage questions. If you have a question and you're not sure about the answer, you can use the chat function in your, oh, I think we're muted. You can use the chat function in your um, Zoom meeting to get a hold of us and we'll be happy to answer your questions that way. Um, thirdly, we're gonna open it up for Q&A at the end. So if you did have a question that you wanted to ask in person or if you wanted to wait until the end, please do so. Um, Rob, are you ready to go with that being said? Yep. Yeah. Great, great. So uh, a little bit about the agenda. Um, first of all, um, what we're going to go through tonight is what does 2021 really look like? What does the market look like? What are we seeing in the marketplace? Um, we're going to talk about why I work with a local team. We're going to talk about the benefits and, and the reasons why it might help you to get more of what you want um, working with a local team. We're going to talk about financing, of course, and some of the strategies and some of the ways that you can be prepared. Um, and we're going to give you a brief overview of the process and how it all works. So if you're a first time buyer or if you're not a first time buyer, but it's been a couple of years, things have changed in the market. So it'll be good to walk through that together. And then, of course, time for Q&A. So uh, we expect the whole webinar to be around 40 minutes, but um, it, you know things could go a little bit longer um, or a little bit shorter. So you know we appreciate your flexibility. Um, I'm just going to keep letting folks in as they as they drop in. It looks like we have some more coming in. So we'll give everyone a bit of a minute to to jump in and just get, get connected to the audio. Um, and then we'll proceed. Um, Rob, while we're at it, did I miss anything? Do you have anything you wanted to add at this point? No, everybody can hear us okay? Uh, yeah, Hopefully. yeah, I think so. We're we're not muted. We were briefly muted in the beginning. Um, okay. But we're, we're totally good now. Yeah. So yeah. just letting a few more people join in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, very good. So, so far, everyone is muted. Um, again, uh, for those that are just joining, um, we would be happy to open it up to questions. Um, you can unmute at the end. Uh, for now, if you have questions about um, anything that happens in the webinar, you have questions about the content, just drop it into the chat and I'm happy to um, to answer them or to walk through with, the, with you whenever you drop that question in. Um, thanks to Ryan for telling us that things sound okay. Um, so with that being said, we'll, we'll just continue on. So Rob, <clears throat> um, why don't you get get us started with this big number? Yeah, the big number. So yeah, nineteen point eight percent. You know, this might not mean a lot, but so what this is medium sales price in Guelph from uh, February twenty twenty one to um, February twenty twenty. So basically over a year, uh, almost a twenty percent increase in the price of homes. Uh, typically, what we see in a year, year over year, is about five to six percent. So. The 20 really stands out, and um, I'm sure the people who are currently in the market uh, buying have seen this, you know, the massive increase in the in the value and the price of homes. Exactly. So, so tell us more about that. Yeah. So again, so here's some just some more. We got to go over stats, right? It's all about stats and numbers. Um, 701,000. So this was the median sales price for a home in February, uh, in Guelph, um, over to the right, you can see a little bit 795,000 for detached, uh, semis and townhouses, uh, 651,000 condos and apartments, 489. And uh, the funny thing is, is that the number uh, the 489, this is what an attached would have looked like, you know, just a couple of years ago. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, so Rob, are, are you seeing um, any particular category, you know, sort of bearing the brunt of those price increases or, or more people flocking to 
singles in this area or semis and towns? Are you seeing the competition a little higher in some areas than others? It's so it's really hard to say. And like, we'll get into the reasons why the increase in numbers. But I mean, the one thing is, is like, you know, the GTA with people coming from GTA moving here um, and essentially bringing their money. Right. <laughs> so right. if they're, we're seeing much more million dollar homes in Guelph, like, you know, a couple of years ago, you'd see a few and then people are like, oh, wow, it's listed for a million. Well, you can see the number that the average is 795. So there's a lot more million dollar homes. Um, but I think I really think the driver is in the semis in the towns like they've they've gone up considerably more than anything else. Um, and this is probably what people are looking at buying right now. The majority of the people, um, even the condos. So some people like I've had clients that have we're looking at detached homes at the start of their search and they were priced out of not only detached, but the semis and towns. And then, you know, they have to uh, purchase a condo to get into the market. Right. Yeah. I, I so, what I find with the, the, those that are on the financing side, it's just a lot of the folks trying to get into the market, you know, with down payments that used to be able to afford you a really nice detached home, you know, the prices are just going up so fast that, it's actually hard to even keep up the down payment savings with the increases and they end up yeah. you know putting more money down on maybe a smaller place and just hoping to be able to ride that that equity growth for the next couple of years until they can move up when when the timing is right that's right yeah yeah it's all about getting yeah. in when you can if you can afford it you get in right right exactly you know and it makes sense because you know if if your house is worth say it's a semi versus the round 650 and prices go up this year, it's sort of a strange year. Maybe they go up by 10%, yeah. which is which is abnormal. That's a $65,000 increase going into next year. So so That's there's right. not many of us that can save up an additional 65 to keep your equity whole, you know? So in a lot of cases, you're better off to, to make that move a little quicker, but um, then you can ride that equity growth for the next couple of years as that happens. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly Good right. to know. So. Um, so tell us about yeah, 2021. So things, what does it look like? <laughs> yeah. So I, 2021 is a lot, is a continuation of 2020, um, uh, with COVID, obviously COVID has changed uh, the real estate market. Um, you know, kind of gone are the days of open houses, you know, I remember when you first buying a home and you're going out every weekend, Saturday, Sunday, going to a bunch of homes, checking out the open houses, talking to the realtor that's working there, whether they want to talk to you or not, whatever. And um, so now, yeah, no more open houses. Now it's basically you're doing a lot of your shopping online. Um, so you're dependent on uh, professional photos being done, uh, maybe a virtual tour, videos of the home, which are being, you know, it, the, the te te technology is growing and growing just over the last year alone. Um, but that's not to say that you can't go physically see the home. So basically what you would do is you would, you know, book a showing with your, uh, with your realtor, um, your realtor, you know, full disclosure, your realtor is probably going to, um, qualify you before they do. And we'll get into more about that, about, you know, what the qualification looks like, but you've got to be ready to be purchase a home in the market. It's just, it's not like what it used to be. Um, you know, the buying process versus the past. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not like you go and look at a home and you put an offer or you, you either put an offer in that day, if you love it. Right. Or you think about it, you go back, you look at it a day later, maybe even a week later or a month later, or, you know, right. maybe it's still on the market a month later. Now homes, homes are on the market for typically a max five, five days, four days yeah. to a week. So it now. sounds like, it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, we used to have more time to make these really big decisions. And <clears throat> now buyers just don't get the luxury that they used to have. So, so you're going to no. go in there and, you know, you might be able to get, is it, is it 30 minutes, 15 minutes in a, in a showing and then, yeah, you know, somebody else is, is maybe behind you and then you're sort of left to yourself yeah. to decide basically, am I going to, am I going to spend half a million or more dollars based on 30 minutes? You know, I joke with you, but like, 
I think I spent more than 30 minutes researching which cell phone I was going to buy or, you know, what, you know, yeah. like. What, what you're going to watch on Netflix. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I probably wasted more than 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the point is like that, that puts a lot of stress on buyers, right? That's yeah. put a lot of stress on buyers. So it's, it's really worth it, knowing that the world is a little different. Yeah. Yeah. It, so, it, it, it is, it is completely different. So it's, you have 15, 30 minutes to make the decision. Um, another thing too, is at, also with the buying process is, um, knowing price, right? So, um, not necessarily is the price of what it's listed at cl even close sometimes to what it's going to sell for. We're seeing homes oh. sell for 50,000, hundred thousand. Um, there's even, you know, the one in, in Kitchener that was, you know, advertised over $300,000 for, for, yeah. uh, for a semi. So, um, it's just, you have to kind of, um, educate yourself and, and knowing that there's going to be competition, right? It's not right. just going to be used to making an offer. Um, and of course there's holding offers, right? So for those that aren't, aren't familiar, um, what, uh, agents or what listing agents and sellers are doing now is there, you have, like I said, about maybe four or five days to view a home. Um, and then on a certain day, they're going to hold offers. So they're going to look at any offers that they get that day at a specific time. So basically right. you have to have your offer in and you're probably going to be competing with, you know, probably at least one other offer for the most, majority of the time, sometimes even up to 30 to 40. I had clients, uh, hmm. what was it? Uh, a little less than a month ago, I guess we were competing with 33 off 32 offers. There was 33 total offers and we ended up winning, um, yeah. submitting a bully offer. That's also, that's also sometimes uh, a strategy, right? So if, uh, if the listing agent and the seller agree that if they receive an offer that is, you know, I, I laugh, but it's the Godfather too good to be or too good to turn down. Then, right. uh, you know, they'll take a look at it that day. Right. So it, yeah, things are, are much, much different. Yeah, it, it, feel, it feels like a totally different world, you know, versus when, you know, I bought the house that we're living in now or a lot of, you know, my yeah. contacts and clients have bought their, you know, their first home or, or whatever. So, I mean, the, the yeah. point is that it sounds like there's got to be a way to be successful when you're faced with like less time to see the house, more competition, unrealistic pricing or, or may, at least unclear pricing. Right. Because yeah. I, what I what I heard you say was, you know, people are listing a house for X, knowing that it's going to go for much over that price because yeah. they're you know planning to hold offers to generate that demand. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm hoping that we can talk about, you know, how can people how can people like minimize the chances of losing in these situations? How can they get through these things together? So um, maybe why don't we jump into, you know, what what can they do or is there something else we need to know about? you know, the COVID process or how things are before we jump into that? Well, I mean, yeah, with the COVID process. So again, it's a little bit different. Like, you know, when you went to an open house, you take the whole family, it'd be like a family event going out. So now the showings, um, no children, um, yeah. basically it's just the two adults going in with the realtor 30 minutes for the showing. Um, and it's going through all the safety precautions. Like I tell my clients when I go in, you don't need to touch anything if you don't want to all let's minimize it to one person doing the touching. I'll do it. And then it's, you know, basically kind of using your hand sanitizer after every showing mm -hmm. um, masks always. Right. So we're doing everything we can to keep, to keep your clients uh, safe as well as um, you know, the sellers as well. Right. 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 So I mean, that's, th those are the things to keep safe um, with regards to uh, strategies. So we can get Let's into strategy. That. Yeah. No, yeah. so you know, it's funny before you, before you mentioned it, it's just funny because I think back to, you know, last year and they talked about how the market's going to totally drop as far as pricing. Right? Yeah. We all were, everyone was worried about a, a real estate catastrophe and yeah. you know, based on what some of the, the pundits were saying, especially I know we talk about, you know, CMHC and what they CMHC. were thinking. And, yeah, that guy's never going to live that down, poor guy. But anyways, um, I, I, I get what they're coming from, but it's true. Like, you know, it, it does make it harder to sell and harder to buy, 
right? So yeah. we got to have some ways that we can that we can help to mitigate and help people to make the right decision. So, you know, from from your point of view, um, how how do people be successful this year? What do they need to do? Yeah. So again, preparation and execution, right? It's right there. Uh, I mean, the first thing you want to do is you want to know how much you can afford. And we had talked about this before, about being qualified. So going through with your qualified buyers. And by that, I mean, you know, you're speaking with, um, you know, a, a good mortgage broker, mortgage agent, um, your bank, if need be. And um, it's about knowing how much you can afford and getting pre-qualified, right? That is key, being pre-qualified. Yeah how much you can afford so that you're looking at the right homes right yeah it really makes no sense if you're if you're going and you're looking at million dollar homes only to find out that you're um you're qualified for five or six hundred thousand right yeah i mean it, it you know knowing that you don't get much time with a property right this yeah. is the thing that that i try yeah. and explain to a lot of my clients i say well listen like you can go and shop and you can look but what's going to happen is if if you find the perfect house for the perfect price and you're not already pre-approved, you're at a huge yeah. disadvantage because everybody who came in before and after you is already pre-approved and may put an offer in without the condition of finance, you know, because that's happening. Yes. And I hate to say it, but it's happening. So, you know, it, it, it just puts you at a disadvantage and that's why, at least on my side, and it sounds like on a lot of the realtor side, you know, getting that client to really understand how much that they can afford, how much the bank will, you know, or the or the lender will approve them for is just ultra critical. Step one, don't skip it. Yeah. Even though it's fun to go house shopping, like don't skip the money it part. Is. Don't skip the money part. Yeah. And, and that's just it. It's about being market realistic. So again, going back to... Um, you know the price the listings the listing price of homes right sometimes those can be skewed they can be we're seeing a lot of agents um significantly undervalue homes in order to draw much more people in and you know it's not fair to the buyers so it's right. about having that conversation with your with a good uh, buyer agent and um they should be able to tell you which homes uh, have a good idea of how much this home is going to sell for right Right. Or at least a yeah. minimum price of what a home is going to sell for. You have no idea what the top end is because there's always, it seems like there's always one buyer out there that's willing to write a blank check, right? So Because they just don't want to deal but, with the hassle. So it's just like, you know, yeah, here. Yeah. That, yeah. And yeah, that's, here, that's crazy. I, yeah, I, want this, I want this home. I'll just pay whatever. But I mean, you see that in, in some instances. But again, it's, um, and it's planning for competition too, right? Um, or trying to stay out of competition. But um, what you want to do planning for competition is create, have a strategy from day one, right? So it's being pre-approved. If you know you're going to be competing, uh, like you had mentioned, David, uh, financing condition, you know, it's going to be very, very tough. I tell my clients it's going to be very, very tough to win any um, offers with conditions, with any conditions at all. Um, you know, a lot of people say, Hey, I want, I want to have a, I want to put a home inspection in this. Well, we should have had that discussion a little bit earlier because, you know, if we're competing with 10 other people, almost guaranteed, all of them will not be have home inspection. So as soon as you put in a home inspection, it significantly decreases your, um, your chances of winning, because that is a condition that the seller is going to look at and say, Hey, I've got nine firm offers over here. Why would I accept an offer that has a condition in it or financing condition or, you know, heaven forbid you have to sell your home and you're trying to win with a sale of property condition. Um, you know, that is so just, it's great. It's like it's, I'm sorry, Rob. It's just, that just seems so crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, so it does. the point is, I guess being, you know, we can't, we can't change as an individual. We can't change what's happening in the market, right? You can choose not yeah. to be in the market if you want to, but knowing yeah that you know there's so many people out there looking to buy a house looking to move maybe their jobs are changing they're working from home their families are changing whatever um there's be be prepared but with finances be prepared also to you know um maybe pre-inspect right is that that's sort of a way that you can go at it right is, is do those things yeah. up front and yeah that will probably make a big difference for you yeah i you know you know i always uh Think of it like if you can't get a home inspection done, um, have a pre-home inspection done. Have yeah. have somebody take a look at that. 
before you put the offer in, right? I understand now you're spending some money up front, but if this is the home that you really want, I think, you know, a few hundred dollars is definitely worth it for peace of mind as well, right? Well, that brings um, up it's a point, a if... Yeah, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I was just going to say that brings up a point. So we, we have a question from the audience, which is Ryan's asking, yeah. you know, how many, how many homes have the inspection done by the owner? And, and can you tell me more about what a pre-inspection is? Yeah, so there are some agents out there that will um, do uh, have a, a pre-home inspection done. Um, I have a colleague. She does it on all of her listings. Are you talking them. about the sellers it's doing actually, The sellers are doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I mean, if you think about it, it's actually a, a good idea. You're giving the peace of mind of people, of, of letting the people know um, what to expect right now if something does come up um, that's major that might need to be done then the, you know you'd have to disclose that but um, I mean in most cases you're giving them the information up front so that you know you can feel a little bit better about that firm offer that you're receiving from a home inspection point now now from a financing you know that could be a little bit different um, right and We'll go into strategies of how you can win offers, um, you know, with that. So but, on, on the home inspection then, so what, what it sounds like you're saying, you know, cause I, you know, I'm a buyer just like everybody else, except when it comes to the yep. money part. Um, yeah. sometimes the listing agent or the seller will do a pre inspection and then sure. the buyers get to see a copy of that. If they're serious or whatever, they can yeah. basically say, okay, I yep. want to see it. And what that does is it helps the seller to sort of like wipe away concerns that maybe the house yeah. might need an inspection. So it helps them to get top dollar. And they paid it for does. that. The seller has paid for that because they think it'll pay off. Or yeah. the buyer can do their own pre-inspection if it's not available. They'll send a home inspector in, in advance of offer day, Yep. pay the money that it costs 300 or 400, whatever it is, depending on the size of the house. Right. And 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 just consider that an investment in in research before they have to put an, an unconditional offer in. So there's two ways it yeah. can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In most Good. cases, you probably the buyer would get their own pre home inspection done. There's not a lot of uh, agents out there that uh, are sellers that will get the pre listing. There are some, um, and it is it is a good idea to do that, but not all. In today's market, it feels like people the sellers have sort of like minimal. Minimal commitment to do it because they're going to get the money yeah. anyways. So maybe in today's market, that might be tough. But as, as you know, the market balances out in supply and demand, perhaps, you know, buyer or sellers may do this more often to encourage unconditional offers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good yep. to know. So, 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 you know, talking about that and, and leaning back into what you said about strategy and creativity, um, what are some yeah. of the other things that they can do? to make sure that they're successful and that they get the house that they're really looking for. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you want to go in with a competitive offer, obviously. Um, I don't ever suggest my clients putting in an offer. If I don't think that they're going to win, I, you know, I let them know up front or you, the chances are, you know, very, very minimal because you don't want, what you don't want to do is you don't want to drive up that price. You don't want to be one of the offers that drives up that price. There's always offers that are driving up the price. So you mean, um, you know, even though nobody knows what the offer price is, if other agents yeah. hear that there's 15 offers, it right. makes them feel like it makes the other buyers and the other agents feel like, oh, I better really sharpen my pencil on this because the competition yeah. is heavy. Yeah. I, I mean, see. basically, let's say let's say a home is listed for 500,000 and I have clients that want to put an offer in for uh, 490,000 and we see that there's 10 offers on the home. Does it really make sense to put in that offer right. for 490, knowing that very well that there's going to be offers that are going to be better than yours? Your, you know, not so great offer is just going to drive up the price, right? Especially for somebody that really, really. Did. So right. So I want to go back. I want to go back to the the strategy because I think there's some important things we could talk about. But um, yeah, another like a follow up question on the inspection thing comes in from Ryan saying, you know, um, are the inspections public so can anybody can all buyers see inspections that get done i don't think all i don't think all buyers can i think if you're if if you're going to be seriously bringing an offer like um then yeah they would they would send that off i don't know that 
all that the listing agent would send it to all buyers. So you're talking about um, the, the, perspective, the, the, the perspective buyers for sure. Yeah. So you're talking about with like the, if you're if showing the seller interest, has funded yeah. their own inspection. Yeah. Yeah. So if the yeah. sellers funded their own, they can show it to whoever they want and they probably show it to serious buyers. If they the, yeah. if the buy, if you're the buyer and you've paid for your own, then that's only yeah. yours. Yeah. Now that's not to say not everybody, because I mean, I've gone into uh, homes before where the home inspection was done by the seller and that home inspection sitting on the table, on a kitchen mm. table, where you can, you know, leaf through it, take photos, whatever of, mm -hmm. of the home inspection that's been done. I mean, that happens as well. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. I, I think I just wanted to clarify right. that because I think it's a great it's question good. and I think probably a lot good of people questions. have that question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so getting back to some of the strategy, um, what else can mm -hmm. you do to be prepared? Yeah. So, well, and so in winning the offer, having a strategy from day one, it's, um, putting in a strong offer. Um, so here's something, David, you don't necessarily have to have the highest, this is going to sound crazy. It's going to sound crazy. Even for realtors, maybe on the call, <laughs> you do not have to have the highest offer, uh, money wise to win. To, how, okay, wait, stop, hold that? on, wait, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah. So, whoa, 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 whoa. so I'm selling my house and I'm going to take not the highest offer. Help me understand how that happens because it, because that's the people are going to, people's ears are going to perk yes. up around something like that. Yes. So the way this can happen is you sell your buyers to the sellers. You let them in on who they are. It's, you know, you're, you're selling your clients. Um, the, the one thing I like to do is, um, if my buyers love the home, they're going to put an offer in on the home, do a video, do a video after you're showing of the home and let those sellers know what you loved about their home and why you feel you'd be a good fit. Um, maybe your kids, um, are friends with the neighbor's kids or something like that. Um, you know, if you know people on the street name drop, you never know, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, doing video, um, if you can't do a video, even a letter to the seller is a great idea. Um, I, I have minimum do this with all my clients to get them to do up a letter. Um, I've won, and I think three of the last four offers I've won have, have gone because of the letter. And I so, think I mentioned so, to you. Yeah, no, I'm just, it's, it's mind boggling, right? Because you, know, you think as a seller, yeah. everyone just looks right at the dollars. And I mean, let's be realistic. You know, we're not talking about winning over an offer that's fifty thousand more than yours. But yeah. when there's twenty offers, it's just it's just like applying for jobs. When there's twenty resumes, if there's something yeah. you can do to get yours to the top, or if there's something you can do to get your offer to the top, and that might be a, a yeah. video that that sells the story, like explain to them why. Yeah. You know why yeah. you might be it the is. best that's person. It is. It's a story, David. It's a story, and you, if you're really good at telling the story to the listing agent and the sellers. You can win and you don't have yeah. to. Now, you know, you still have to be in the ballpark with the money. You got to yes. be in the ballpark. You can't, you can't go in low and expect to win. But if you're in the, uh, if you're in the ballpark, um, you know, I had this happen, like with the clients I'd mentioned, right? We weren't the highest offer. We weren't even the second highest offer. We were the third highest offer out of 33 offers. And we ended up wow. winning because, you know, I was able to build a rapport. That's another thing. So you build a rapport with the listing agent. Mm -hmm. You don't do things that are going to irritate the seller and the listing agent. A right. lot of agents will do this, <laughs> will irritate the, um, right. will irritate them. Um, let them know who your, who the buyers are. And so lastly, another thing you can do, we had talked about conditions, right? Financing condition. So there's a financing condition. There's going in without uh, financing and just submitting your offer on a piece of paper. And then here's the trick. Here's having your um, mortgage agent, your mortgage broker, call the listing agent personally saying, hey, Mary and Joe, I'm working with these guys right now. I understand they've submitted an offer. I can tell you that they're, they're good. They're good for the mortgage. Right. So that puts the mind at ease with the seller and the, uh, the listing agent that, right. um, you know, that the money that they don't have to worry about picking up yeah. the deposit check tomorrow. That that's common. The deposit check's coming on day of closing. They don't have to 
frantically or think, oh, is, are we going to, are they going to be able to close or not? They've already been reassured by, you know, right. the buyers. I mean, it, um, it's so funny that it's, it's so funny. Just, uh, you know, like when you think about the way that this usually works, you know, I, I often don't hear from anybody in the, in the process until there's a house that's, that's been agreed to purchase. So how, yeah. so, so ask the question, how many times has, and I think part of that is like, I, I could, I could obviously improve the way that I do this by making that suggestion more often to my clients when they're out there. I say, listen, if you yeah. want to contact the seller, I will, but yeah. think about how often somebody doesn't get a house and has to go back and put an offer in another place or another place or yeah. a fifth place. Yeah. All because maybe, you know, there was some color to the commentary that could have added, right? Like you just got to, and, and yeah. this, frankly, the same thing happens on the lending side, to be honest, like, you know, we're not talking about lending, but you know, there are, there are cases where it's a slam dunk and like, yep, they're getting the mortgage. The numbers are perfect. There's absolutely no reason why this house is not perfect, but there's a lot of, a lot of lenders. And the more you get into this, you realize that sometimes when there's a gray area and there can be a gray area for a whole bunch of reasons, it could be credit, it could be income, it could be the house, it could be the situation, anything. A lot yeah. of underwriters, they really want to know the story. So, you know, it only makes sense yeah. that that the story and being creative can overcome, you know, whether or not they're making yeah. X number of dollars or a little bit more than X number of dollars. Yeah. And those things that I just mentioned, those are not time consuming things. Those aren't things that are going to take like hours at a time, a two minute video, yeah. um, a, a two or three minute call to the listing yeah. agent. Um, a five minute, a five minute written um, letter. It's just a little bit, just a little bit extra. You're going that, you're doing that little bit extra for your clients, right? And it will help for sure. Right, right. No, I. And so I the last agree. point here about building your team, and it's about you know communicating, right? It's about communicating with your clients. Um, you know, having everybody being on the same on the same page as well. And I find the process of the home buying process and even after the home closes is it just goes so much smoother when you have your, your realtor, your mortgage broker and your lawyer all on the same page communicating. Right. Just makes I, the, I, the process I couldn't agree more. Much, what, yeah. When I have, like I have a client who just got their approval tonight um, and it was sort of a unique situation because there was a zoning, a question about zoning in this property where, you know, they're buying residential property, but it's zoned in a strange way. And this is one you can't overcome. But when I connected with their accountant, when I connected with their lawyer, with their realtor, you know, each of these people has a has a part to play. You know, I ended up having to find out yeah. that, you know, the, the way that the documentation was at the township wasn't correct. Like there's a whole bunch of things that that can play into this. And if you build your team as a buyer, remember, we're talking to buyers in this in this call, right? You as a buyer, if you yeah. build your team, remember it doesn't cost money to have a buyer's representation on your real estate agent, right? That's right. The, the price is the price. It doesn't yep. cost money to work with a mortgage broker over just contacting the bank that you have your checking account with. Like it doesn't cost money to have access to 50 lenders versus one or access to all yep. that advice versus none. So, so put a team around you because a team is going to help you to be successful. Yeah, I totally get yeah. it. I told totally you exactly agree. it. So, so what are we missing here? I mean, that was, that was really interesting, but like, is there anything we're missing here before we sort of slide forward in this and, and give people a little bit more information about, I think it's financing next. I don't know. Is there anything we're missing? I, I think we've covered a lot. I, think, I mean, I think really yeah. that's, that's, that's big. Yeah. Okay. Let's, 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 let's dive into, I think the part about being local. Right. So, so the reason why, for me, this slide is so important is because um, we have a lot of out-of-town buyers. We have a lot of people changing cities. We have a lot of people moving into Guelph or moving into KW or wherever from a lot. It's the GTA, but it could be anywhere. And having um, representation from somebody that knows the area just becomes so critically important because there's things that are going to be special and unique. And Rob, this is really your thing, but help, help us understand yeah. a little bit more about these things. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you want to, you want somebody who knows the area, knows the neighborhoods. Um, you know, the one thing that we're seeing more and more of is uh, parents want their children going to the best school, a top school yeah. in, 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 
in the city, right? So it's about, you know, your realtor is going to know, your local realtor uh, is going to know, uh, you know, what what the best neighborhoods are or you, depending on what neighborhood you're looking for, right. um, you know, is it going to be possible that you're going to have a student living beside you? Um, you know, where there's going to be like frat parties out on your neighbor's front lawn every, every other weekend, you know? Right. Um, right. So it's things like that, that you, that you want um, your clients to know about. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Local. So, so yeah, I mean, and, and there's, there are, there, we totally get that a lot of folks bring maybe representation from out of town um, because it's yeah. people that they trust. Right. But there's some things about the, about the unique market here that makes you an expert. I mean, I, I, if I were, yeah. you know, educated in this geography, it doesn't mean that I necessarily could sell a house in Windsor. You know, I can look up the stats, but yeah, but I can understand how that might be harder. So, you no, know, being connected yeah. locally is re is really important. I think that bleeds into the second point, which is is you know have have a team. We talked about that in the last slide, but remember that your 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 team is not just your realtor and your mortgage agent and maybe your lawyer, right? Um, as you're as you're preparing to move and as you're making that move, um, you know I get requests all the time from clients and you probably even more for yeah. things like, hey, can you recommend a, a good lawyer? Can you recommend um, a plumber or electrician? We want to get something looked at when we move in. Hey, can you recommend somebody yeah. that can help? You know, and so there we're talking about you know I, we joke and say like the welcoming committee, but you know a lot of folks would, would move into a new area of town, maybe not even a new town, but a new area of town yeah. or, or a new city yeah. altogether and, and not know anybody. So that's right. So being locally connected, you know, can really help to make you feel more comfortable to fit in sooner and to avoid pain and frustration when you can't figure out who to call. And you're, you know, like we don't, we don't use a phone book anymore, but you're on Google searching for, you know, which, which plumbers available, yeah. you know, it's not going to, be too expensive or do a bad job. Right. So that, that's just critical. Yeah. The local, the local realtor or the local people, the local teams will have that Rolodex of people that they've worked with before and that they're, yeah. you know, all of our jobs are referral based, right? So it's about referring out to people, the good people that you've worked with in the past. Right. 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 And I think that's important. Right. So, you know, the, and that's, that's more along the lines of the third point, which is, you know, Yes, we're we're invested locally. My business comes mostly from referrals, right? Like, you know, so so yeah. what that means to the buyers is that I'm really invested in and I think the same goes for you, Rob, but we're we're both really invested in the success and happiness of our clients. So when I get a client, yeah, you know, this is not this is not a one and done thing because it's very likely that that person may refer someone to me in the future and if I make sure I take care of them in whatever way that I can, you know, I'm more likely to be able to grow my business, which, which ultimately is, is what we're after. So, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not about, you know, doing a deal and then forgetting about it. It's not about that no. at all. It's about like, cause everybody yeah. talks about their experience, right? Oh, I have a guy, I know somebody, oh, she helped me. That was my great real that she had. Like those things are all super important. So it's nice to know that, you know, there's some local connection that's going to help people no matter what. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I think that that sort of ties into the, the last point about stress, but, um, tell us more about seeing trends. Um, you know, what, what can somebody in this market, if they're looking to move into the, the Guelph, KW, Cambridge, um, what, what kinds of things can they expect as far as trends that maybe they wouldn't see if they weren't working with, you know, somebody who had that somebody local experience? Local. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's about, you know, you know, um, so we, I found out very quickly that, uh, you know, the big trend of the GTA people being moving this way, right? Especially yep. last year. Um, so, I mean, there's picking up on that trend. Uh, there's also, you know, what, um, what projects are, are going on in the city, right? Um, Google doesn't always tell you about, you know, what local builds are going up, where are they going, schools that are being built, uh, high schools, public schools, whatever, right? Uh, it's just looking at for things like that, um, that, uh, and giving that information to your clients that yeah. you, you no, wouldn't I, I, be able to necessarily find online. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. And it, it's way faster and easier to get that information from someone who knows. So again, it all, it all yeah. sort of wraps up into making it less stressful for people 
to find somebody that works in the area that knows the area that you can trust because they can help yep. make the whole purchase process, the buying process. Remember, like, you know, realtors know each other, right? And and I know yeah. lawyers in town, like, you know, we these are people we've already worked with. So when you have a relationship that already exists, think about how much easier for the client that gets. So this is just good yeah. for people to know when they're thinking about making that move is, you know, find someone you can trust that that can give you the, you know, the best experience possible. Yep. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, now, this is my favorite part, Rob. The part about money. Yeah. You get to talk so, about money. I, yeah, that's my favorite part. So, you know, for, the, for those on the call, um, most of you are probably familiar with what a mortgage broker does. Um, but, you know, it's worth saying that um, as, as, a, as a mortgage broker, I don't work for any one lender. I'm not employed by any one of the lenders. Um, you know, last year, my brokerage dealt with over 50 different lenders. And my job is to basically match make to connect the, the client, their family, whatever their situation is with the right mortgage for them. Um, sometimes it's for refinancing or sometimes they already have a house, but whatever it is in the case of buying, you know, it's about making that connection. So, you know, the important thing to know, and I said this earlier is that clients, excuse me, clients do not pay for the services of a mortgage agent or a mortgage broker. You shouldn't be asked to pay your, your, um, compensation comes from the lender. So that's important to know is that, you know, this is, we should, we disclose this up front is that the lender pays a finder's fee. So, um, we go out and we shop the market to find the best possible deal. And that's how that works. Um, the next question I always get is about mortgage rates, but, um, before we do, there's a question coming in. So the question is how to choose the right mortgage. Can we talk about the different types? Um, yeah, I will definitely do that. Uh, thank you very much Arturo for that question. So, um, in the topic of rates, this question is really timely. So, you know, essentially what people will often ask me is what's going to happen in the future, right? And, you know, I joke about the crystal ball and polishing it up and looking inside and, you know, I never get a good answer. So, you know, the only thing we can do is be connected to the market and know the factors that, that contribute to those things. And from there, it helps me to make much more educated uh, commentary on what's happening. So, you know, for example, right now, and this this helps to answer Arturo's question a little bit, um, different types of mortgages, primarily we're talking about fixed and variable. And from there, we're talking about different lengths of term from one year, two year, all the way up to 10 year, right? And some lenders are doing more 10 years and that, that might be interesting, but um, the main differences between fixed and variable are very simple. In, in a fixed rate mortgage, you're promising to pay that lender X number of payments each month between now and when it's over. So that you're making a commitment to pay that same amount of interest to pay all for the next five years. Um, in some ways, it's sort of like a lease, right? You're committing to the payments. Um, in a variable rate mortgage, your payments go up and down based on changes in the interest rates. Now that may sound scary. They don't necessarily go up and down very quickly, but they can change. Um, so floating payments in a variable rate mortgage and fixed payments in a fixed rate mortgage. That's the biggest noticeable difference. The other differences that people need to understand mostly come down to penalties. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but essentially fixed rate mortgages, when you want to change, pay off, sell, refinance, anything. If you need to make a change and break that contract, you're going to face a prepayment penalty that is usually much higher in a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage. So if your lifestyle is that, hey, we might get transferred to my job, my, you know, my family might uh, move here, we might need to get a bigger house. If you have a chance of maybe needing to sell before the term is up, it's really important for you to understand the penalty and we can talk about that a little bit later on, but basically you need to think about your lifestyle so that this is to answer Arturo's question. You can choose the right mortgage by thinking about your lifestyle, um, your comfort level with risk, and be really honest with yourself about the chances of you moving or not moving because about 80% of Canadians still pick the five-year fixed, but about two thirds of all mortgages don't make it to the five years. So what that means is that two thirds of people have to pay a penalty to refinance or break that mortgage before it's up. 
And it can be very expensive in the case of a fixed rate mortgage in the first couple of years to get out. So your mortgage broker, um, or if you're working with your bank directly, they should be, you should be having very detailed conversations about this. It should not, your penalty should not be hiding on the last page. You don't talk about it. It's important to talk about it now because once you're in, the cost to get out can be, can be a lot. So I hope that helps. Um, this, the next thing I want to go over is, is getting approved for the highest amount. Um, there are things that you can do to make sure that you maximize your approval. And the things I want, want to mention is primarily plan ahead. So if you're thinking of buying in a year, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with talking with a mortgage broker right now, call up, have a conversation and there's no commitment. Talk about your situation. There's things you can do. I just had a call with a client about, you know, two hours before this webinar started and they want to buy in six months to a year. And they asked me, should we pay off our um, credit cards first or should we save more for our down payment? Should we maximize our savings or should we get rid of that debt? And the, the answer is different Questions. for everybody. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the answer is different for everybody. That's the funny thing about it because yeah. what ends up happening is it depends on your individual ratios. So without getting into deep detail, ask early and then we can make choices and we can make decisions in the process that can help to improve that for you, right? Of course, save up as much as you can, but if you don't get over 20%, there's a lot more regulations and guidelines in the approval. So we can talk about how being over 20% might help you to get flexibility, especially if you're you know, self-employed or uniquely employed. Um, so that's, that's really critical. Um, we talked a lot about condition of finance earlier, so I won't spend a ton of time, but be aware that conditions of finance are harder to get. Um, it's harder to be successful with that. So the more research you do up front, the better. Um, get pre-approved and ask your um, mortgage lender, ask your mortgage broker what was done for that pre-approval. So some pre-approvals, people don't know this. Some pre-approvals are literally done by a computer. It's like 30 seconds, you're pre-approved and based on whatever numbers you put into that calculator. So that's fine. But just know that if nobody looks at that and really starts to analyze the situation, that pre-approval is not as valuable as if somebody had really reviewed it. So there's a difference. That's called a fully underwritten pre-approval. It's uncommon, but some lenders do it, but it's a lot of work. Then there's, you know, where your mortgage broker can really look at the documents for you. And that's really the big difference is you want to have somebody actually review your documentation. So if you put in your income, yeah, I made 87,000 last year. My wife made, you know, uh, 97,000 last year. Okay, we added up. Okay, that's our number. We want to buy a house for 600,000 approved. Be very careful because um, overtime gets judged differently than re your regular pay. Um, if you're hourly and your hours are inconsistent, then what you did this year, let's say your 2020 taxes, you got your T4 and your money, your, your income was much higher, but in 2020, it was less. So in 2019, it was less. Just know that hourly employees have to look at a two-year average. So bonuses, commission, overtime, um, self-employment, all these things you may not think are, are important, but they factor heavily into the amount you get approved for. So, you know, without spending too much time, because I know we're going long on this, um, make sure you ask questions about what was like, what kind of pre-approval do I have? How confident are you? And, and that's why it's so important to work with somebody you trust. Now, how confident are you in this pre-approval? Because I have clients that they're totally comfortable and I have others that say, no, I want the condition. So that you just, you just have to know. And you know, the, the last thing here before we get into you can empl unique employment is know your exit strategy. So I sort of talked about that earlier, but what that really comes down to is everybody worries about the mortgage rate. Everybody asks me about the mortgage rate and they all, you even talk with your friends sometimes like, Hey, what rate did you guys get? Oh, we got a good rate. We're at whatever. Nobody worries until they have to about the price to get out, right? The mortgage rate is the price to get in, but the penalty is the price to get out. So ask about that when you're going through the process, make sure you understand what are the prepayment penalties like? How much can I prepay? Right? Nobody thinks they're going to want to pay more on their mortgage than they have to, but breaking the mortgage because you sold the house is the same as prepaying. So be aware of that. And, you know, lastly, for those in unique situations, self-employment, CERB, if you get ahead of it and ask questions of your mortgage agent um, upfront, then it can make such a difference in your approval. So, so 
focus heavily on this when you're a buyer. You know, even if you're selling your existing property, ask a lot of questions and make sure you feel good about the things that you're hearing so you can feel confident. You know, when you get into Rob's office or your realtor's office and you go and look at houses, right? Make sure you can feel confident about it. So um, I, ho I hope that helps for those that are, you know, thinking about the financing side. Um, so let, let's move on to the next part. Um, so this is the process. I mean, Rob, why don't, you, why don't you walk us through the process? For me, the process starts where I go on realtor.ca and I start looking at houses and then I just go to open houses. And yeah. I think I usually skip some of the stuff, but t tell me, <laughs> where, where yeah, am I going wrong? You're probably skipping a lot of stuff. Yeah, you might even skip the whole process of, you know, it just going from uh, going online and then uh, just trying to put in an offer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just but call no. call the listing so, agent, tell them I want to put in an offer yeah. and I want the best deal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's what, you know what, that's what a lot of people do. And that's, that's not the best way. But um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, the first thing you want to do is you want to set uh, your goals up, right? So you want to agree on, um, you know, a timeline at least, right? When do you want to move and how, how does that look? What type of home? Um, so you want to be in agreement with that. Next step is uh, what we've kind of been talking about a lot and pre-approval, right? So it's finding out how much you can afford, how much you can spend, how much is that uh, lender going to give you to help you get that home? Um, after that, yeah, on it's, goals, you know, Rob, it's, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but on goals, are we talking about your goals for the house? Are we talking about having discussions with your family? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And having discussions with your family. Yes. Yes. Having, having okay. discussions with your family. Okay. Yep. Or it could okay. be personal goals in life, whatever. Well, yeah, <laughs> depending on your situation. I'm just Whatever's saying like, it, yeah, <laughs> it's, starting, it's the plan. It's really the starting with the yeah. plan, right? What does the plan look like? Um, and, and I've seen that before where clients actually, you know, they have like, you know, a spreadsheet of their plan, which is great. Um, Spreadsheet's my favorite client and, yeah, right it's, there. It's, exactly. Can't go wrong. So, and then, yeah, you pick your realtor, you go to showings um, and, you know, it's choosing wisely, not open houses. Um, you know, you, depending on how many uh, offers, but you're putting it in an offer and then you get an accepted offer. And um, so we put in be patient. It can take some time, especially in the way the market is today. It could take several offers before you get the right one accepted. Um, yeah. And then yeah. finally, there's, uh, you know, a getting approval and the closing and it doesn't stop at closing again. Um, it's, you know, the communication with your team again, that's, that's all part of it. And it goes, it continues even after closing, right? Um, like we said, you know, if you are having, if you need to, if you need a contractor or a plumber, it's reaching out to us and letting us know what you need. Right. Our job, no, our funny. job doesn't stop at closing. No, no, not at all. In fact, most of my clients ask me that question. Hey, what happens after we're done? Do like, do we stop talking to you? And you know, no, the answer is no. I, I can still help to you know, make administrative changes. I keep an eye on rates for you and make recommendations for, you know, maybe you should consider switching halfway through. I mean, I'll, I look at all that, but you know, what I see here on, on this slide really is in summary, it's that most of us, we get excited. It's like car shopping or house shopping. And I want to go right to step three. I want to go right to showings. I don't want to do the part where I have to think about the real reality. I don't want to, I, and, and I'm not saying that sort of in a funny way. I'm saying, I don't want to think about the hard stuff. I want to go to the part where I can look at the house that I want and, or the car that I want. And it's just, it's so critical if you want to be successful to work, talk, to figure out the goals. And that doesn't mean you have to have a list of things written down or a binder. Um, you know, you just have to know because those questions are going to come up with your realtor, your mortgage agent, all that. So, so start with a good foundation plan so that you can execute. And this is how we can win in 2021 and beyond. Um, a question just came in um, from Brittany. So Brittany says, where in this timeline would it be appropriate to start working with the realtor? Is it before or after pre-approval? So um, I, I have a take and maybe you have a different take, but I, what my yeah, take is ahead. that, um, Brittany, it's a great question. Often the pre-approval is probably the first time that I recommend you reach out to anybody. Um, although, you might find that talking to your realtor first might help if you're not really sure about your goals as far as the house. So for example, maybe you're not sure about condo versus freehold. Maybe you're not sure about some of the big picture stuff and you just wanna know 
you know, which big, which direction you want to go in. Maybe it's the city, maybe it's the, the type of house and you might want to get some education first, but I, I wouldn't recommend going out and seeing houses. Some realtors won't even take you out to see houses until you get a pre-approval. But in a lot of my clients case, I'm the first person they call and maybe they have the realtor either waiting in the wings because it's somebody they know and trust, or, you know, maybe they haven't talked to them yet, but it, it, it might depend, but I would say you want to do the pre-approval really early because that sets the stage for everything and makes your, you know, process with the realtor so much easier. Rob, do, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, I know I have lots of people that I'm still waiting um, on them to, to speak to somebody about their, their financing, right? Like, right. you know, they've already either reached out to me or I've reached out to them, but they haven't even talked to, uh, they don't have their financing in order, right? So there's really nothing you can do until the financing. So, so it's definitely in between, you know, setting your goals and pre-approval or after the pre-approval and obviously before showings. What I do see a lot of the time though, is uh, they skip the goals, skip the pre-approval, skip the showings and boom, it's right to the offer. <laughs> I found like, a house, put an offer in. Home. They see, yeah, where's my finger? They see, they see the home that they want online. They have not been pre-approved. They have not yeah. done the showings and they just contact the listing agent and they say, Hey, yeah, I can, I, when can I see this house? Yeah. And yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, so here's the thing too, right? A lot of people like to work with the listing agent. So think about this. The listing agent has signed a contract all the time, 100% of the time with the seller. So they have a right. binding contract with somebody. Is it going to be in their best interest to um, try and get a deal with you or try and get a deal for the person that they have a contract with? So, right. Um, you know, this is why we have buyer agents. Um, they again, our services are free. We only get paid on, you know, the, the sale of a home, but we're here to give, provide advice, give you the information you need to make the best decision. Right. Right. Exactly. Hopefully so, I mean, we, we joke, we joke about it, but you, you definitely should, yeah. you know, do try and do the process as much as you can. Um, sometimes yeah. you, you know, the things are out of your control, but in general, that's the, that's the, the preferred way to go about it. So, you know, I, I think once yeah. we cover that, that covers a lot of the things that, that we want to talk about. And this, you know, we've actually gone a little long today, but you know, in sort of wrapping yeah. up, um, you know, I, I, I want to, first of all, thank everybody. Um, I think we went through a ton of content today. Um, we sort of expected it to be a little shorter, but you know, this is a really important topic for me and I get sort of excited about it and I'm sure same for you, Rob. Um, yeah. so at, at this point, you know, if somebody has questions,